My name is Thurman Berry. I was born in Windsor, North Carolina, a small farm town. And I moved to Philadelphia when I was 16 years old. My name is Tyrone Works. I was incarcerated at State Correctional Institution at Greedy Ford from 1975 to 2011. I kind of decided that I didn't want to be involved uh, with the crime, so I stayed in the car and waited for them. And uh, when they came back to the car, they mentioned that someone had gotten shot. In, in my mind, I felt like I was innocent because I had nothing to do with it. I told them I didn't want to, want to go. Uh, but about 30 days later, I was uh, arrested, uh, charged with murder, tried, and found guilty of second degree murder, which is a mandatory life without parole sentence. We sat outside the bar and hatched the plot to rob the bar. We did so during the commission of the robbery, a person was shot and killed. Judge found me guilty of second degree murder and sentenced me to a life sentence in prison. It didn't matter whether I was the trigger man or not. The only thing that mattered was that, that I was there. And he said it was a felony murder, so he sentenced me to life in prison. When I heard the sentence, I didn't know how that feel. I didn't know exactly what, if I had to spend the rest of my life in prison or at some point I could get out. It was some years later that I learned that life meant life. Prior to that, life didn't mean life because people was getting out of prison. 12, 15 years on a life sentence, they were getting out, depending on them. But when I got there, about 10 years later, life meant life. Nobody was getting out of prison. Although I was arrested in, um, 19, um, in 1975, I actually went to Greedy for, got to Greedy for in June of uh, 1976. And you know, when I got up there, I was really angry, I was really bitter, I was resentful about the criminal justice system because in my mind, I was thinking I was innocent. And so I was really, really angry that I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. There was this guy that was a seminar leader, a seminar director, and he was leading this program and it was an all day event. And, and then he stopped me and he said, Wow, you seem like a very angry, bitter young man. And see, he says, it zooms out of me. I said, absolutely, I'm angry and bitter. Justice system found me guilty. I said, when I, had, when I hadn't killed anybody. And so he said, yeah, man, all that might be true. He said, but you got a daughter, you got siblings, you got parents. They're going to really need you. And I said, they're going to need me for it. I said, I'm the one in prison for the rest of my life. But I was very selfish. I was only thinking about myself. And he said, look, just promise me one thing. He said, I don't know how long you're going to be here, but as long as you're here, try to create a great life for yourself. I began to think about the conversation I had with this guy. And, uh, but that night myself, my subconscious kind of pushed all this information to the front where what actually happened was, was when the judge sentenced me to life without parole, there was all this weeping and boo-hooing and crying and my mother fainted and my sisters ran out the courtroom and the victim's family was crying and all that. And in that moment, I had this powerful epiphany and I realized that I had to take responsibility not only for my life, but for the crime. I started this process early. I got locked up and I was arrested in 1976. In 1987, I filed my first application for commutation. At that time, they told me I just didn't have enough time in. So I continued back and forth through the courts. I stayed in court in and out with the appeals for 24 years. But after serving 39 years, I got my opportunity. Finally, somebody listened to me. Mr. Burke, who enlisted Dr. Brown, with Lieutenant Governor Stack, and the whole crew, Secretary Wetzel. Somebody listened to me. They heard my story. They believed my story had merit. Therefore, they recommended me for clemency. 
commutation. hasn't been anyone released since Tyrone Wirtz. It was Tyrone and two other men in 2010, and then nothing. So the students would choose who they wanted to write for, um, and we would take the ideas that the inmates gave us, because this has to be from them. It's not from me, it's not from the students. What do you want expressed? And so we just said it better than they could say it, and we said it with academic references. We, we submitted them you know, for these men. And then it became the Department of Corrections calling me, saying, hey, this is great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, what can we do here? So yeah. I met the staff that works for the Board of Pardons. Um, and where it's gone since then with Mr. Burke and, and uh, Mr. Johnson is that they choose the candidates based on the, they have their own criteria. So I called my contact at Greaterford and said, can I, I'd like to make an appointment to meet with Mr. Barry. He did. Um, I went in. I, I didn't know what anybody told Mr. Barry about why he was meeting with me. Apparently, nobody told him anything. They just said he was meeting with Dr. Brown. Thurman was having some medical problems at the time, and he assumed I was a medical doctor coming in to deal with one of his issues um, and was wondering why we were meeting in a, in a conference room and not in the medical <laughs> complex. So when I came in, he looked very puzzled and said, you know, why are we meeting, why are we meeting here? And quickly I figured out that that's what he thinks. I said, no, Thurman, I'm not here to deal with your health. We can talk about that if you want to, but I'm here to get you out of here. <laughs> the look on his face was precious. It was one of those moments where you wish you were allowed to take a camera into, into prison. Yeah. He was stunned. Help get me out of here, what do you mean? I said, we're gonna get you out. Let's do it. I heard about people whose lives have been ruined or uh, people who were trying to turn their lives around and couldn't get meaningful employment, couldn't get anyone to give them an opportunity because they had a criminal record or they had been in prison and people weren't willing to give them a chance. So what happens is someone finishes their probation or they get released from incarceration and they have the highest ideals. They wanna go and get a good job and go back and be a part of their community, be, be a big uh, a contributor. And then what they find out is they can't get hired for good jobs or any job sometimes. They can't get good housing. They don't have the same opportunities as other people. If it's a really bad economy, then, you know, the person's gonna be unemployed. And uh, so that it leads you down a path where as much as you try, the only way you can succeed economically is through crime. And that's a ridiculous pattern to set for people. And until we give people a second chance to get their record cleaned up so that they can truly get involved and uh, get a decent job that pays a good wage, support their family and be a part of society, we're all gonna fail and we're gonna have to waste billions of dollars. My exposure to the commutation process um, started when I was a unit manager. It's literally 160 hours of physical work to put the commutation package together. Interviews getting all of the information from, uh, from Tyrone, getting things in his own words, having the staffings. I don't want to put a person back into the community who's going to commit harm. I don't want any further harm to come out of the action that we're about to take. So I look for your ownership of what you did that day, how you felt about it, and what you have done since then to take corrective action within yourself to make it a possibility for you to return to society as a productive member. The Department of Corrections has got to focus in right away on people who are really interested in changing their lives and receiving redemption. We've had two or three other applications. Uh, women wrote and submitted applications. They have not been doing that since the 90s. They felt that it was hopeless. And 
this project is, is, is giving people hope. That's an important thing. So I got in touch with myself a lot with the self-introspection, my motivation, my focus. I knew what I had to do. I did it. I've been home and, and I've been really been enjoying my life. Um, I recently got married and I'm, I'm settling down and um, I, I just want to uh, just enjoy life. And actually what I'm really working on right now as a personal thing is try to help other guys make the transition back into the future. Try to stay a positive force for the guys inside it and uh, give them some encouragement and some hope. My message to anybody who feels hopeless is that, you know, hope is, a, is an action and sometimes you got to dare to hope. And years ago, you wouldn't have thought that anyone could get a pardon or get their sentence commuted. What I hope it provides is, is, is uh, some hope that life doesn't necessarily have to be life for everyone, that there is some place to go. Incarcerated applicants should contact the Department of Corrections Interagency Liaison, the Bureau of Treatment Services at 717-728-0380.